All right. Next we have uh, the work of Abraham Maslow. Maslow was a uh, psychologist uh, who was around in the 60s, 70s, 80s. His work on the hierarchy of human needs has been transformational. And many of you here will have heard of those. Just indicate, would you, if you have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of human needs? Yep, quite a few people. It is, it's coming out of a whole sort of tradition of up until Maslow did his work and others followed on after him, uh, psychology was all about fixing problems. People, people only went to see a psychologist when they had a problem and it was all directed at fixing that problem. So, you know, normally you're, you're, just, you're just being you and you don't need that sort of enhancement. He said, well, let's look at it from the al alternative point of view and develop a psychology that allows you to proactively manage your own state of mind and mental health so that you are highly effective, as highly effective as you possibly can be most of the time. And if you do that, then you're going to head off any of those problems down the track, you know, depression or whatever, addiction. You'll have a better way of dealing with it. And to me, that makes a lot of sense. It, uh, so the cornerstone of his work was this idea of hierarchy of human needs. And for those of you who haven't heard of it, Simply uh, put, says that all humans, all of us, regardless of culture, have the same set of needs. But it isn't just equal needs, it is a hierarchy of needs which have to be satisfied in order. In, in you know, the low, the low order needs first, then the middle order needs, then the high order needs. So at the lowest order, we have the need for oxygen, say, and we have the need for food and we have the need for water. If we don't have those things, we're going to die pretty quickly. So uh, somebody who, who is starving hungry isn't really going to be thinking about much else besides, you know, where can I get something to eat? But a bit above that, you've got... Um, you have got uh, things like, uh, well, uh, shelter is another one. Uh, there is, uh, well, sex uh, is another one at the, towards the low end of things. Then at the middle, you've got, you've got um, sort of self-esteem type issues like, do I have something worthwhile to do with my time? How do I feel about, do I have a good occupation? So an unemployed person who feels aimless and miserable is not satisfying that middle order need. But you can find purpose and you can find an occupation and you can get, you can derive value from that. There's a number of these. I'm not going to go through all of them, but that's representative. And then at the very top, you've got what he called self-actualization, which by which he meant you are simply approaching or you are in the process of moving towards your fullest potential as a human being. And now each of us have way more potential than we currently express, every single one of us, myself included. We're all in the process of moving towards our own fullest potential. And there is a philosophy uh, about technology that technology at its best is that which allows people to progress along that continuum to self-actualization. You know, think about all of the things that you can do now with current technology that you couldn't do 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or that people in earlier generations couldn't do, simply because it didn't exist. But we can do it now, and it feels good to do it. We like it because it helps us be more human than we were before. So he basically says, okay, so you cannot call this up on demand. You cannot just decide to be self-actualized, get up one morning. No, you, you simply, as I was saying earlier, you, if you know what the 
mindset factors are and you model those factors, then you will inevitably uh, move towards that state. And so whilst you can't whistle it up on demand, you can create the right conditions for it to happen spontaneously. And he identified that uh, when someone is, is close to that goal, um, they experience sporadically something he called peak experiences. Now, the peak experience is simply, uh, you know, a feeling of complete um, absorption, a bit like the flow state, complete but more blissful, complete absorption into the present moment where a sense of individuality ceases to exist and you feel yourself to be completely connected with everything around you. That's what Maslow, I say he's just not a religious uh, guy or a spiritual guru. This is a psychologist and this is what he observed. So people approaching self-actualization experience these peak experiences. But what's interesting about it is that if you compare the description of a peak experience with, let's say, Sartori in Zen or enlightenment in other traditions, then it's very similar. And uh, there is a definition of, of enlightenment which, uh, which seems to satisfy all traditions, and that is you develop a sense of felt connectedness with everything. Your sense of self no longer exists and you feel yourself to be part of a much larger whole. Now, I know I'm getting way, way... This, is this a technology course that we're doing? Well, it is, in a sense, because what I'm talking about here is how any of us can move towards that state of higher fulfilment of our own potential. And it's going to be different for everybody. It's not going to be the same for any two people. So what I'm giving you is a blueprint for how any of you can go about doing this. And I talk about it in detail in the notes. So the first thing that Maslow says that people who are in the process of self-actualizing do is to simply be in the moment. Now, you've probably heard of mindfulness. Now, he wasn't thinking about mindfulness, but that's what you'll hear about. Mindfulness is simply about focusing your attention in the present moment and realising that that's the only real moment that actually exists. Thinking about the past is just a mental construct. Thinking about the future is just a mental construct. The now is the only thing that is real. And if you are aware of the now and you are hyper-conscious of what's going on in that now moment, then you are experiencing things fully and vividly and somewhat selflessly. So it's being in the moment and not resisting the way the moment is. Most people go through life reacting to circumstances many of which they don't like. You know, think, think to yourself, if you were catching the bus and you came around the corner, you're still 100 metres from the bus stop, there's the bus just pulling away from the curb and you know it's going to be another 20 minutes before another one comes, you're going to think, oh, you know, you're going to be annoyed. Anybody would be. The challenge that he's talking about here is to be more or less okay with it. Not to like it, not to simply say, oh, I'm glad that happened, but to simply accept it as reality and then deal with it, accept it, and basically to not mind what happens. Uh, look, that's, that's, that's a hard thing to do for anybody. I, I totally understand. I've been trying to do this myself for years and, uh, you know, it, I, I've had patchy success, but I realise that, uh, you know, you do have to just not mind what happens too much. Ongoing choice between safety and risk. That's a mindset that boils down to, you know, if you choose the uh, 
risk option, and it's a calculated risk, a manageable risk, not a type 2 error, but a type 1, then, uh, you know, that way lies a, an experience that you'll learn from and grow from and benefit from. You may not know how or why before, you, before it happens, but uh, that will be the outcome. Safety simply wants to stay in the comfort zone and not move out of it. Now, it's a well-known thing that nobody grows if they stay permanently in their comfort zone. You only grow when you take yourself out of that zone. Um, our true self. Now, the thing about us humans is that we are highly social creatures and we are programmed for conformity. We're programmed to be part of social groupings and to understand what the group norms are and to conform to those norms and to basically be good members of groups. Humans are group, individu group individuals. We are individuals who like to form groups. And that's really, really deeply fundamental in human nature. So that really is to say that um, if all we do is conform to group norms, then we're not actually living out of our true self, who we actually are. I'm not suggesting to be uh, openly rebellious or disruptive or, you know, somebody who just makes trouble for the sake of it. Not at all. I mean, get along with people by all means, but know who you really are and live authentically from that sense of who you are. And when uh, that differs from the group, then so be it. Even if the group decides they don't want you in it anymore, you're better off out of it if the price for being a member is that you have to give up your self. Uh, and listening to your own tastes is an indication of that, <clears throat> what you actually like. Use your intelligence, uh, self-explanatory. Make peak experiences more likely by adopting those mindsets. You know, the, the notes around those headings explain all of this in great detail. Uh, so really, honestly, I encourage you to read uh, the notes for this week. Uh, I think you'll get something good from it. Um, and character, oh, and uh, all of that will make peak experiences more likely. To know thyself, you know, in ancient Greece, there was this thing called the Oracle of Delphi. And uh, people would go to the Oracle and ask questions and get answers. The Oracle was a god or a goddess, I'm not sure which, but divine. And uh, basically there was a temple and above the door of the temple in Greek was written that inscription, know thyself. And the, the sort of philosophical underpinnings of that idea is that there is this thing called the microcosm and the macrocosm. The microcosm is everything inside you Macrocosm is everything outside. But here's the thing. The microcosm and the macrocosm are identical in nature. Not in scale, obviously, but in nature. And so they say the only way you can actually know the outside world is by means of knowing that corresponding part within you corresponds to the outer. <clears throat> you can't know the outer directly. You can only know the inner as a reflection of the outer. And that is what the oracle was all about. It was simply saying the path to wisdom is to simply go within and know yourself. And uh, that's an aspect that Maslow identified as being part of the whole self-actualizing process. He characterised people who are self-actualised or close to 
as being like this. They're realistically oriented with an efficient perception of reality that extends into all aspects of life. They accept themselves, others, and the natural world the way it is. They're spontaneous. They focus on problems outside of oneself. They have a mission that requires much energy. They are somewhat detached. They enjoy solitude. They're autonomous in the sense that they embody their own set of rules. They don't look to anybody else to tell them how to behave. They know how to behave based on what they know to be right. That's what autonomy actually means. Freshness of appreciation, to simply uh, look at something that you've seen a hundred times and suddenly see something new and interesting and fresh about it. And uh, here is his description of that self-actualization and this, uh, of peak experiences rather. Um, it does read very similarly to enlightenment. Feelings of limitless horizons are opening up the vision, the feeling of being simultaneously more powerful but also more helpless than one ever was before. So, you know, this is not spiritual mumbo-jumbo. This is psychology, believe it or not. Uh, you can read Maslow's book. It's one of the central, most respected canons of modern psychology. There's nothing silly or flaky about it. All of which comes around to me saying to you that the best way to have a really good career is to, is to step back and realise that it's about creating the right conditions within yourself for that career to manifest itself later. It's much more than just career action plans and essays and, and e-portfolios. Those are, those are artefacts that spin off from the process. So, you know, it's, it's really a question of how do I go about creating those right conditions for myself. Um, one of the other things to mention here is the Myers-Briggs test. If you haven't done it already, I encourage you to try it. You, you may already know it's one of the most widely...